Yesterday we spoke about the uh, one of the well probably a first metabolic pathway which was the respiratory chain or the electron transport chain and today we're going to continue with a metabolic pathway which is very closely related to the electron transport chain it's connected to it um, and we could say that one without the other couldn't really exist namely we'll be speaking today about the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, or the citric acid cycle. So those are three names of the same pathway, uh, which we'll cover today. Now, the Krebs cycle has its name from its discoverer, Hans Krebs, who discovered the whole thing in 1920s and 30s, when he was working, well, mostly 30s, really, when he was working um, at Cambridge. Hans Krebs was a really interesting biochemist. I mean, he had to flee Hitler, so he had to flee from Germany um, to England, where he continued to work. But already in Germany, he discovered another cycle, another metabolic path pathway that we'll cover later on, which is the urea cycle. So he discovered that, and then he described uh, all the steps in the, uh, in the citric acid cycle, which is now called the Krebs cycle. Um, the Krebs cycle is one of the, or probably the metabolic hub of our cells, and not just our cells, but basically all cells that exist. So we could say that the Krebs cycle, or a modification of the Krebs cycle, is really the foundation of all the other metabolic pathways, because most metabolic pathways originate or end in the Krebs cycle. So we will see a little bit today, but of course later on when we cover the other uh, metabolic pathways, we will see how they connect to the Krebs cycle. It is so central to the metabolism of most living organisms that there is a theory, another hypothesis, about the evolutionary origins of the Krebs cycle, which says it's actually one of the oldest, probably not the oldest, but one of the oldest metabolic path pathways in existence. And one theory says that in fact the Krebs cycle started running in the opposite direction than we normally see it running. So it wasn't really producing carbon dioxide and breaking down compounds, but it was actually synthesizing compounds by running in the opposite direction. And this hypothesis, which has some empirical support, <coughs> so it's not just a wild guess, this uh, theory posits that this proto-Krebs cycle running in the opposite direction arose originally deep in the ocean where uh, the hot gases and hot fumes from volcanic fissures um, leave the, the crust and go into, into, um, into the water and react with water. Uh, and these things actually exist nowadays as well. Uh, they are very deep in the ocean, lots of hot water, lots of gases, sulfur, hydrogen, all sorts of things. And there are, and this is this is one of the reasons for this hypothesis. There are organisms now living in these vents, they're called vents, um, which rely purely on the chemical energy of these vents. There's no light there, they can't photosynthesize. Okay? All the other life on Earth is primarily based on photosynthesis, really, directly or indirectly. Um, but these organisms are completely independent of photosynthesis and they live from these chemical energies that come <clears throat> from these volcanic vents. Um, and as I said, this theory says basically that's where life originated. And this Krebs cycle that we'll see in a second running in the opposite direction, well, it started slightly shorter and then it ended up being this, was the pathway that developed there. And it developed actually before even there were cells. So this pathway was running in prebiotic environments. It was just running on its own. And it needed, as a, as a catalyst or as catalysts, it needed iron. And more specifically, it needed iron in the form of a mineral um, called pyrite, or maybe some of you have heard it, these golden crystals, um, which is ferrous sulfide, which exists in these, in these vents or near, nearby. And chemists could show that these crystals of ferrous sulfide are capable of catalyzing these reactions of this reverse Krebs cycle. And connecting this hypothesis with what we heard 
yesterday and what we're going to hear today as well, <clears throat> we spoke about iron sulfur clusters which are present in some of our enzymes in the respiratory chain and today we'll see one such enzyme uh, in the Krebs cycle as well, actually two such enzymes in the Krebs cycle as well. And this hypothesis basically says, well, these iron sulfur clusters are basically re remains of this mineral, of this ferrous sulfide, which we still carry with us two or three billion years later, because we need them, we still need them, uh, to catalyze some of these reactions. Okay, so this is a, a deep time connection between our mitochondria um, or our cells and possibly the origins of life. Uh, the Krebs cycle is such a fascinating pathway there's a whole book about it. It's a popular book by Nick Lane, who is a professor of evolutionary uh, biochemistry at UCL in London. A really interesting book. Those of you who are interested in the history of life and history of biochemistry, it's really, really interesting. Lots of interesting stories about Hans Krebs and how he discovered, how he described the Krebs cycle. It's quite incredible because in the 1930s, they basically had no methods. Like they were using like one method to do the whole thing, which is from today's point of view, absolutely incredible. Right, let's have a look at the Krebs cycle. Now, as I said, it is sort of a hub for all, well, for most other metabolic pathways which begin or end there. And in this respect, it is quite important to realize that many cells might be running just portions of the Krebs cycle. So it's not necessary for the Krebs cycle to run the whole way, okay, uh, round and round. But in many cells, when they need, you know, they need to get rid of something and to produce something else, they can be running just a few of those reactions, which happens very often. And I'll show you today in this lecture, we'll show you one of, this, one of these uh, modifications of the Krebs cycle. And at times, the Krebs cycle can be also running at least partly backwards in our cells. Okay? So, the usual description, which I would use just a few years ago, I would use as well, I would say, okay, the main point of the Krebs cycle is to oxidize acetyl-CoA to, uh, to uh, carbon dioxide. Well, that is not really the case. That would be a really misleading description of the function of the Krebs cycle, okay? So it is a connection of reactions which can be used for many different purposes in many different situations in cells, okay? So it is really this universal tool Okay, universal wrench that the cell can use for, I'm not going to say for whatever purpose it needs, but for a lot of different purposes. Okay? Now, in order to uh, hopefully get you to see this versatility or this, uh, also the cyclical nature of the whole thing, I will not start from the usual place where we start, but I will start from basically from where we ended, uh, where we ended yesterday. So I will, st I will start with the enzyme that we mentioned yesterday, which is part of the Krebs cycle, which was it? We spoke about one enzyme when I said this is part of the Krebs cycle. Complex two. Yeah, complex two or succinate dehydrogenase. Okay, so we'll start from succinate dehydrogenase and then we'll complete the whole cycle because we can, it's a cycle, right? We can start anywhere we want. It just goes round and round if it runs the whole way. So we'll start with succinate dehydrogenase, which we said is in the is in the Krebs cycle. It's in the Krebs cycle. Matrix. It's not in matrix. Yeah. Succinate dehydrogenase is, where is it located? In the inner mitochondrial membrane, right? It sits in the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay? It is looking into the matrix, but it's actually sitting in the membrane. So I'm gonna draw membrane. Here we have succinate dehydrogenase, our complex two, okay? But again, complex two can be misleading, so it's probably better to call it succinate dehydrogenase, okay? Here would be the outer membrane, and of course, I didn't say that, but you probably know that already, the whole of Krebs cycle occurs in the matrix, okay? So we are, everything will be happening in the matrix of the mitochondria. So, as we said, succinate dehydrogenase takes succinate, and this time we'll be using the structures. So without structures now, it's gonna be very difficult to get around, okay? So we start with succinate. We take two electrons away. Where do these two electrons go? To coenzyme Q. Uh, 
And what are we left with after this reaction? We form a double bond between these two carbons and we form fumaric acid, fumarate. So I will draw it in a little bit more detail because it is important. So we form a double bond between these two carbons and what is important is that fumaric acid is the trans isomer. So this is what it looks like. So the configuration on the double bond is, is trans configuration. So from succinate to fumarate. Okay. Now, what happens next? In the next step, well, actually, I will say another thing, perhaps, and that is because I, I mentioned that many metabolic pathways either start from or end in the Krebs cycle. So with these intermediates that we'll go through, I will also mention other pathways that may be adding these intermediates into the Krebs cycle. So succinate or succinyl coenzyme A, which is one step before, we'll get there, okay? But succinate can be, for example, produced by the degradation of some amino acids. We'll see, see that later on, okay? Not many, but some amino acids can end up with succinate or succinyl coenzyme, coenzyme, coenzyme A. And the other interesting pathway that can lead to the production in a few steps to the production of succinate or succinyl coenzyme A is the degradation of fatty acids with odd carbon atoms. So most fatty acids that we produce and also that we take in the diet, they have even number of carbon atoms. But there are some, and actually, for example, in dairy products, the, the, the percentage of these odd, odd carbon number of fatty acids is quite high. So if we take a lot of uh, dairy products, we will have a lot of fatty acids with odd number of carbon atoms. And once they are broken down, after a few further steps, again, something that we'll cover later on, we will get to succinate, or rather succinyl coenzyme A, okay? So this, this can feed into the, uh, this can put intermediates into the Krebs cycle. And we can also take succinate away, again, more in the form of succinyl coenzyme A, which is the step before. For example, to make heme in hemoglobin or in cytochromes, et cetera. So for the synthesis of heme, we use succinyl coenzyme A. Again, something that we'll see later on. With fumarate, yep. How do you define those intermediates? Intermediate is anything which is in the middle, okay? It's on the, basically in the middle of this metabolic pathway. Anything is an intermediate. So if it's a circle, then all of them are intermediates. Okay. Yep. Good. With fumarate, uh, there are also a few sources of fumarate uh, in, in the metabolism, and probably the most notable one that we will see later on is the urea cycle. So the cycle where urea is produced from ammonia. So there in one step, we produce fumarate, which can then come into the Krebs cycle and something happens to it, either directly or indirectly. All right, moving on from fumarate, yeah? Yeah, so this could be reversed under conditions where the membrane potential is very, very high, which means basically that the Q pool, all the molecules of coenzyme Q are reduced and the reduction potential starts pushing electrons the other way around. So under this situation, this reaction can be reversed. That's, that's the answer, okay? So it can be reversed, but it needs very, very special conditions for it to happen, okay? But it can potentially be reversed. In the next step, we take fumarate, and in the pattern that, remember when we talked about rea chemical reactions in metabolism, I said that there's this usual pattern, oxidation, hydration, oxidation. So this is exactly the pattern that we see here. So we oxidize, we make double bond, and in the next step, we add water, to the double bond. And we make an acid which looks like this, which is called malate. Okay, I'm going to write down the
malate from malic acid. <coughs> we have a pattern, so the next step is going to be oxidation. Uh, this time we will need, as the acceptor of electrons, we will need NAD+, forming NADH. And of course, this NADH will then be reoxidized primarily in, in complex one. Okay, complex one will take this NADH, recycle it so that it can come back and be reused as NAD+. Okay, that's what we saw yesterday. Okay, the product of this reaction is, well, we're oxidizing this OH group here. Okay, so the product is going to be keto acid looks like this. Hmm? NAD plus is the oxidizing agent, correct. Okay. So we get a molecule looking like this, which has a name which is probably a little bit more difficult to learn, to memorize. Uh, but this is called oxaloacetate. Now, where is this strange name coming, coming from? Okay, so malate comes from the apple, okay? It's the acid found in the apple. Fumarate comes from a plant which probably no one's, none of you have ever seen, okay? But it's also called after a plant. Uh, succinate comes from, uh, I don't know what, actually. Anyway, but oxaloacetate has some logic to it, okay? So if you take this part of the molecule, this looks like oxalic acid, okay? And obviously this one looks like acetic acid, hence the name oxaloacetate, okay? We'll see a similar way of naming in another intermediate, okay? Maybe this will help you remember, maybe not, I don't know. So the next step is oxaloacetate. Uh, yeah, I'm not telling you the names of enzymes. Yeah, that's probably important as well, okay? So this was succinate dehydrogenase. This enzyme was called fumarase, or is called fumarase, but you can also find it as fumarate hydratase, which is the more systematic name. Either of them is fine, okay? Fumarase or fumarate hydratase is this one, okay? This one is called malate dehydrogenase, as you would expect probably, okay, so malate dehydrogenase, and uses NAD, NAD plus as the oxidizing agent. Now, uh, malate doesn't really come very much into the Krebs cycle, so there are very, very many reactions, I can't really think of many, that would produce malate that would be then used, I mean, it's, it can be an indirect way of fumarate coming into the Krebs cycle, I'm not going to elaborate at this point, okay? Uh, but malate can be exported from the Krebs cycle and can be used for other things as well, okay? So malate can be an intermediate which is used elsewhere, but it's not the primary one. Oxaloacetate, on the other hand, is very, very useful. Um, and one use, one use of oxaloacetate, so this is not part of the Krebs cycle, this is going away from the Krebs cycle, is that it can be transaminated, okay? So we get an amino acid to an oxo acid, okay? And if we transaminate oxaloacetate, we get, we, we get which amino acid? Hmm? No, we get aspartate, okay? We get aspartic acid. And this is something that we can see in our metabolism quite often. What is the reaction? Transamination, <coughs> okay? So by transaminating this is not part of the cycle. This is a site reaction that removes oxaloacetate from the cycle. So, uh, it, 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 it transaminates amino acids? Or, can you please repeat that part again? So, the transamination of oxaloacetate produces aspartate, mm -hmm. okay? And it's a transamination, that means that you need to use another amino acid to bring in the, the amino group, okay? So, that's a site reaction. Another 
side reaction of oxaloacetate is that it can be broken down to phosphoenyl pyruvate, which is needed for gluconeogenesis, something that we'll cover later on. Okay, so I'm just kind of put a pin into it. Okay, so from oxaloacetate we can make phosphoenyl pyruvate and then make glucose out of it. Okay, so that's another very important use of oxaloacetate. Of course, since we can transaminate oxaloacetate into aspartate, we can also do the opposite reaction. Okay, so we can take aspartate and make oxaloacetate, which can be useful to replenish the Krebs cycle if we are taking other things away. Okay? This is a cycle. Yeah, that's not part of the Krebs cycle. What is part of the Krebs cycle is a reaction which is a little bit more complicated chemically, um, but I'll show you what, what actually happens there. And that is the reaction of oxaloacetate with acetyl coenzyme A. So this thing reacts with acetyl coenzyme A, which may be coming for example, from the beta oxidation of fatty acids, or it can be coming from the degradation of pyruvate, pyruvate being the last product of, of uh, glycolysis. Okay, we'll, we'll, I will show you the, the reaction that produces acetyl coenzyme A in uh, the second half of the lecture. Um, but there are a few different sources of acetyl CoA. Okay, and this acetyl CoA reacts with oxaloacetate, and it reacts in a reaction type, which is called the aldol reaction. I sort of mentioned it a little bit when we talked about the, um, the chemical reactions in metabolism, but I said it's quite complicated, so I'm not gonna show you the details. But this reaction is called the aldol reaction, aldol reaction. And what happens there is that this carbon, I'm gonna use a different color, Yep, that's coenzyme A. Yeah, because remember we said that esters of carboxylic acids with coenzyme A are actually thioesters. Coenzyme A contains an SH group which forms thioesters. So this is just to show that there's this sulfur there. It's not just a normal ester, but it's a thioester. Okay? So what happens there in this reaction is that this carbon attacks the carbonyl atom in oxaloacetate. The carbonyl becomes an OH group and we get an, we get an acid which has three carboxyls, hence tricarboxylic acid cycle or TCA cycle, which is called citrate, hence citric acid cycle. Okay. So this thing binds to it. Coenzyme A is released in the reaction, goes away, and we get a big acid, which is called citric acid. And I'm gonna to try to draw it for you so that you can see the original oxaloacetate and how the citrate was bound to it, okay? Do it like this. Okay, this was originally the acetyl CoA, and this was originally oxalacetate. And this is citrate. This one. Yeah, but it's, it's connected to the sulfur. sulfur. Yeah, this is an ester, thioester. I mean, I if you hydrolyze it, okay. you get acid. Yep. How did you reduce the, the oxygen group on the same curve? 
Yeah, it's not really reduced, okay? It's not really reduced. We just rearranged the bonds around it. It's not really reduced. It would be reduced if this was hydrogen, but it's not hydrogen. It's not a redox reaction, this thing. Uh, yeah, you can do it by, by carboxylating it, by carboxylating part of it. Yes, of course, you can produce it that way. It is a possibility, yeah. If, if you need to get oxalacetate, you can do it by carboxylating part of it. Yeah, that's a possibility. Well, because there is this partial positive charge, okay? But for most more specifics of what the enzyme actually does, just look it up, okay? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because it would be a lot of details which we don't really need. But, but it is really, it has something to do with this positively charged, partially positively charged carbon, okay? The aldol reaction is a general reaction between two keto groups, basically, between two oxo compounds forming an alcohol, okay? So that's, it's a very general reaction. This is just a specific example of it. So look it up. The, the mechanisms are very easy to find. Uh, why haven't you drawn the water? Huh? Why haven't you drawn the water? Yeah, there's probably water coming in. Is there? There has to be. Yeah. No, not really. I'm not missing oxygen, OK? But we'll carry on, okay? If you, if you find where the oxygen is missing, we can, we can discuss it later on, okay? But this is what happens, okay? This is the product. We can, in the break, we can discuss it, okay? All right, so this is citrate, and the enzyme is called citrate synthase. Okay, yeah, I didn't write the other ones, but this is called citrate synthase. Now, this reaction is virtually irreversible, okay? So most of these other reactions are actually quite freely reversible if we need to. This reaction is very, very difficult to reverse, okay? So once you make citrate, you can, you can break down citrate, but it's not gonna produce, well, it can produce acetyl-CoA, but not by this reaction, <laughs> okay? I, I will explain what I mean by that, okay? So this reaction is very difficult to reverse. It's basically an irreversible one-way reaction, okay? But it is true that citrate can leave the mitochondrion and be broken down to produce acetyl coenzyme A. And this is the way how fatty acids are synthesized. So fatty acids in our body are synthesized from acetyl coenzyme A, but it's not the acetyl coenzyme A that is produced directly from glycolysis or something. First, we have to form citrate. Then the citrate goes away from the mitochondrion, and there it's broken down to acetyl-CoA, okay? And then we use it to synthesize fatty acids. So that's one of the uses of citrate, okay? You may find it strange. Why, why so complicated? Okay, we could just use, could just use this acetyl-CoA that we already have here, but that's not how it works in our body in our cells, okay? So first we have to form citrate, and then we chop off acetyl-CoA from it, um, and we form fatty acids. There's any difference between those two acetyl-CoA, like, because the first one can't Yeah, the difference, the difference is that this acetyl-CoA is in the matrix of the mitochondrion, but we need the acetyl-CoA to be outside of the mitochondrion and there is no transport for acetyl-CoA, so we have to transport citrate and then chop acetyl-CoA from it, or so acetate. Like kind of um, for, for the purposes of synthesis of fatty acids, yes. Um, just okay. Um, okay, but this is, this is in, the, in the cytosol. It's outside of mitochondrion. All right, uh, moving on, I'm trying to think where to, where to make a break, okay? But I think we're doing all right so far. So in the next step, we want to oxidize this molecule of citrate. Is there anything that's oxidizable? Hmm? 
So there is an OH group, which is usually the thing which is really easy to oxidize. But this is a tertiary hydroxyl group. It can't be oxidized. I mean, we could probably oxidize and break the whole thing down. Okay, if we were pushing really hard, it would in the end oxidize. But we can't really oxidize it into a ketone because it's a tertiary hydroxyl group, tertiary alcohol. So what we first need to do in order to be able to oxidize this hydroxy group is to move it from this carbon to another one and to make it into a secondary hydroxyl group. And this is exactly what happens in the next step. Um, from citrate, we make isocitrate. So we take this OH group and we move it here. Okay? Now, before I show you that, um, just with citrate, um, I mean, the way I drew it, I drew it so that you can see that we start from this and we get that by adding acetyl-CoA. But find your own way to write citrate because I understand that it's not, I mean, you can derive it from the steps or something, but it's not an easy compound to remember, okay? So find your own way which makes you comfortable drawing citrate very quickly, okay? One possible way is, for example, nicely symmetrical, sorry, like this, for example, okay? This is a nicer way, I think, of, of, of drawing the structure than what I drew there, okay? So there it is so that you can see the steps, but find your own easy way of, of writing citrate because you will need it, obviously, yeah? All right, so as I said, we take this hydroxy group, move it down here to make isocitrate. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yep. No. Okay, hopefully one, two, three. Yeah, that should be correct. So I redrew it, okay, I put it Hopefully you can see it. Yeah, we, we just moved the, the hydroxyl group was here. We moved it down here. Yep. It's called isocitrate. The enzyme, the, the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called aconitase. Conitase, and it is an interesting enzyme for several reasons, okay? One of, one of them is the name. Why is it called aconitase when it is making isocitrate from citrate, right? Well, the reason is that the intermediate in the enzyme, Můžu. Okay, so the intermediate that is formed in the enzyme is called aconitic acid or cis-aconitic acid. What is it? Well, basically, what the enzyme does is it first dehydrates the molecule. It removes this OH group and this hydrogen. It removes water to make a double bond that is with the double bond, it's called cis-aconitic acid. Do you want me to draw it? Well, maybe I can. Let me see, like so. C -H. Okay. Of course, it's a cis-aconitic acid, so it looks like like this, cis-aconitic acid. Sorry? 
Well, because it stays in the enzyme. It never leaves the enzyme. It's just an intermediate within the enzyme reaction. Okay? So we dehydrate it, and then we hydrate it again, but this time we add the hydroxy group to a different carbon. Hence the strange name. Okay? Aconitic acid is also interesting because it was isolated from a plant that grows all over Europe, pretty much definitely Central Europe and all the way to like Asia, uh, which is called Aconitum napellus. I obviously don't know the local names in your own countries, but you can find it growing in mountains here and in Slovakia, and it's also grown in gardens. It has these really beautiful dark blue helmet-like flowers. Okay, it's also deadly, it's very toxic. Anyway, that's where the name comes from for the acid and we only need it because it is the name of the enzyme. And the last thing, I'm not sure it's the thir third thing or fourth thing, last thing that is interesting about this enzyme is that it contains an iron sulfur cluster. It contains this little bit of prehistory. Um, and this iron sulfur cluster is, first of all, it's needed for the reaction mechanism, but second of all, a cytoplasmic sister of aconitase, cytoplasmic aconitase, so this one is in, my, in the mitochondrion, but there's cytoplasmic aconitase, which is used by the cells to detect the levels of iron, okay? We'll see that, we'll have a special lecture about the metabolism of iron, so I will mention that again, okay? This mitochondrial aconitase has a cytoplasmic sister also with this FES cluster, and it is used to detect how much iron we have in the body. Interesting. All right, so we have formed isocitrate. Now, isocitrate, yeah, I don't think there are any reactions in metabolism that would use isocitrate or produce isocitrate, so it's really a Krebs cycle only thing. Okay, exclusive to, to the Krebs cycle. And the whole point of making isocitrate was so that we are capable of oxidizing this hydroxyl group. So this is what we do in the next step. Okay? So we oxidize the hydroxyl group. By means of NAD+. to an ADH, so two electrons are taken away, the usual thing, okay? And what we get is, and again, I'm gonna use these square brackets because it's an unstable intermediate. So what we get is the obvious keto acid. Looking like this. And this compound, using the same rules that we had for oxaloacetate, is called oxalosuccinate. Oxalosuccinate. So this is isocitrate. And this is oxalosuccinate. Oxalosuccinate. Now, as I said, this is an unstable intermediate. Yep. <laughs> well, you, you tell them. <laughs> Shout really loud. I don't think it's gonna help, but anyway. So oxalosexinate is quite unstable. And again, remember when we spoke about reactions in metabolism, we spoke about alpha oxoacids and beta oxoacids. <laughs> yes, we did, okay. Now, alpha oxoacids are really difficult to decarboxylate. We need some tricks, we need some special coenzyme for that. Yeah, we need TPP for that, okay, thiamine pyrophosphate. But beta oxoacids 
are super easy to decarboxylate. They will actually decarboxylate spontaneously. They don't need any help. Now, oxalosuccinate, is it an alpha oxoacid or is it a beta oxoacid? So who thinks it's an alpha oxoacid? Raise your hand. Okay. If you think it's a beta oxoacid, raise your hand. Okay. You are all correct. It's an alpha oxoacid and a beta oxoacid, right? So this carbonyl, with respect to this carboxyl, is an alpha oxoacid. But this carbonyl, with respect to this carboxyl, is a beta oxoacid. That means that this carboxyl is very stable. Nothing's going to happen to it. It can't decarboxylate. But this carboxyl is very unstable. It really, really, really wants to decarboxylate. Which it does. So that's why this is an unstable intermediate. And what we get is the next intermediate of the Krebs cycle, a super important one, which is called oxoglutarate or 2-oxoglutaric acid, 2-oxoglutarate. Well, this whole thing, so all those steps, happen in an enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. Okay? But I wanted to finish all the steps and then I will tell you, but it's called isocitrate dehydrogenase. That's the name of the enzyme. So what we get from it is this. Which is called 2-oxoglutarate, 2-oxoglutarate acid or ketoglutarate also, you find. Okay. So as I said, the enzyme, the enzyme that does both of those things, but the first one is, needs help, okay? The other one happens spontaneously, but it's in the enzyme, the enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. Citrate dehydrogenase, or IDH. Yep. Basically, two reactions in one enzyme, yes. But the first one really requires catalysis of, by the enzyme, the first one. The second one would happen even without the enzyme. Okay? But this oxalosuccinate never leaves the enzyme. It's, it stays there and decarboxylates and forms ketoglutarate. Okay? Now, the reaction from citrate to is isocitrate, so the aconitase reaction, is freely reversible. It's very easy to reverse it, okay? No energy is wasted. It's very easy to reverse. The isocitrate dehydrogenase reaction is pretty much irreversible. We can't go back this way. Okay. However, our cells have different isoenzymes of isocitrate dehydrogenase that can reverse this reaction. So this reaction can't be reversed with this isocitrate dehydrogenase, but our cells have sort of a roundabout by using a different isoenzyme of isocitrate citrate dehydrogenase, which can take ketoglutarate and make it back into isocitrate. But for that, they need NADPH. So they can't use NADH. That would be a reversal of this reaction. But they use NADPH. Now remember, we said that the, the big functional difference between NAD plus and NADP plus, or NADH and NADPH, was which? What, what is the big functional difference between those two? Yeah, and which is catabolic? NAD yeah, NAD plus NADH is mostly in catabolism, which is this. We're, we're breaking down one compound, okay? Of course, here we release carbon dioxide, right? Okay, so we're breaking down. We need NADH. But if you want to go the other way around, we have to use NADPH to build it back, okay? It also has some thermodynamic reasons why that works. Because NADPH is kept by our cells much further away from the equilibrium than NADH. 
So we can get more work from NADPH than we can get from NADH. And that is the reason why we can overcome this and build back, if we need to, build back isocitrate. Now, you may think, why would anyone need that? Well, you'd be surprised. And here we come to a first good example of how the Krebs cycle might be running only partially or even in reverse in some cells. Okay, and I will give you the full story, then we'll take a short break. Yeah, it's time for break. Uh, one of the biggest sources of ketoglutarate or oxoglutarate into the Krebs cycle is the deamination of one amino acid. Which one? Glutamate. Glutamic acid. Okay, glutamic acid is this thing, but with an amino group instead of this oxo group. Okay, and remember, and I keep keep saying remember, but I'm, you know I'm not naive. But we we spoke about it when we talked about uh, chemical reactions in in metabolism. We said that we can deaminate glutamate to give ketoglutarate, so we can just remove ammonia. Okay, it's not transamination; it's deamination, and it's a special kind of deamination. Does anyone recall? Hmm? No, beta oxidation is a different thing. Yeah, it's oxidative deamination. So we actually make NADH as well. Oxidative deamination, strange reaction. Okay, but don't worry, we'll cover it again when we talk about. <laughs> yeah, I can see that people are despairing already. Uh, we'll talk about it again when we speak about amino acids. So don't worry. The important thing that I want to stress now is that we can get oxoglutarate from glutamate. And glutamate is usually very easily produced from glutamine. And there, are, there is a lot of glutamine in the blood, okay? Plenty of glutamine in the blood. So, many cell types, many cells, especially those cells that are rapidly dividing, are taking glutamine from the blood turning it to glutamate, then turning it to, to oxoglutarate, and then reversing the Krebs cycle, this part of the Krebs cycle, to make citrate so that they can build their lipids, their fatty acids. They need to produce a lot of fatty acids if they want to grow, if they want to divide. They need to produce a lot of membranes, right? For that, they need a lot of fatty acids, okay? And this is their way of getting fatty acids really quickly by taking glutamine and by reversing this part of the Krebs cycle and then taking citrate and making fatty acids. Okay, now this is true for stem cells, for cells that need to divide very quickly, for example, in the gut, okay? But it's also true for many cancer cells, okay? So many cancer cells don't really care very much for glucose, okay? They may do, but they only use it in glycolysis, okay? They don't really let it enter into the Krebs cycle. So they shut down large parts of, the, of their Krebs cycle, but they may be using this glutaminolysis, this glutamine to fatty acid or to citrate pathway, okay? So it's a special use, and we will have a lecture all about metabolism in special situations or something, and I'll, I will mention the, the metabolism of cancer again, so we'll see this again. But this is just an illustration that the Krebs cycle may, need not run from citrate all the way back to oxaloacetate and take another acetyl-CoA and like that, because in many situations, this, this would be a really bad thing for the, for the cells, okay? I'm not gonna go into details why it would be a bad thing, that you have to wait for the, for the special situation lecture. All right, uh, let's take a short break. Uh, please open the window so that we exchange the air a little bit here, and we'll continue in five minutes, five minutes. So do you wanna do you wanna know how it ends? I can imagine. Excellent. All right. 
So how it all ends. So we are left with two more steps to complete the whole cycle. Um, and the first step is a decarboxylation of ketoglutarate. But it is again this special decarboxylation because ketoglutarate is only an alpha oxoacid, right? It's no longer, it doesn't have, it already lost the, the beta carboxyl that, will, that was easy to lose. But this alpha carboxyl is difficult to lose. We need to use, you know, big guns to do that. So in the next step, we decarboxylate ketoglutarate, but it is this special kind of oxidative decarboxylation. So in addition to removing carbon dioxide, we also make NADH from NAD+. So both things happen at the same time. Okay, it's called oxidative decarboxylation. And what we get is not succinate, that happens in the next step, but we actually get succinyl coenzyme A. Let's do it like this. Succinyl coenzyme A. I will erase this glutamine, not to confuse you. Okay. Succinyl coenzyme A. So we of course need to add coenzyme A. Okay, so it's the oxidative decarboxylation of ketoglutrate. We remove this carboxyl here. But at the same time, we reduce one molecule of NAD plus to NADH. And we add coenzyme A to it to make succinyl coenzyme A. Well, it is the same as what happens here, but we'll come to that. Okay? But no, it's not, if, if, you, if you mean the synthesis of citrate, or which, which reaction you mean? Oh, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's, I mean, the, C, the CO2 just, oh, you mean the, the coenzyme A? Well, there are m many molecules of coenzyme A around, okay? It may be the same one, maybe a different one, okay? It doesn't, I mean, it could be the same one because they are close by, but it might not be. Okay, so we get succinyl coenzyme A. I'll, I'll come back to this, to this whole oxidative decarboxylation thing soon. But we got succinyl coenzyme A. That is the one that is used for the synthesis of heme and it can, can be produced from the, um, the degradation of fatty acids with odd number of carbon atoms. And in the next step, we hydrolyze this succinyl coenzyme A to get coenzyme A, but at the same time, we also synthesize ATP. How is that possible? Well, the oxidative decarboxylation of ketoglutrate causes such a large drop, or would cause such a large drop in Gibbs energy, that we can use this large drop in Gibbs energy to synthesize this coenzyme A thioester, which carries a bit of this Gibbs energy, and we can then use that to make ATP in the next step. Okay? So if we just decarboxylated ketoglutrate, we would lose all this energy to heat, as heat, it would be released as heat, but by, by dividing it into two steps, first making a thioester, and then hydrolyzing the thioester, we can harness this remaining drop in Gibbs energy to make ATP. Okay? So the decarboxylation of ketoglutrate would cause such a large drop in Gibbs energy that we can use part of this drop to synthesize a thioester with coenzyme A, which keeps some of this. It's difficult to make. It's kept far away from equilibrium, right? So we need some work to, to do that. And we can then use this bit of Gibbs energy, which is hidden in this, so to speak, to synthesize ATP. 
in the next step. Okay, so that gives us an, ad an additional molecule that we can use to power something. The enzyme that causes this decarboxylation is called oxoglutrate dehydrogenase, oxoglutrate dehydrogenase. And the one in the next step is called, so we basically name it by the opposite reaction, it's called succinyl-CoA synthetase. Succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. Even though it is catalyzing the opposite direction, but it can actually catalyze the, the reaction according to its name because we can actually go either way here. Okay, it's a reversible reaction <coughs> under certain, certain conditions. What is the, the, that enzyme is used in which part again? This enzyme is called succinyl coa synthetase. The one that uh, catalyzes this direction? Yes. I mean, it catalyzes both directions, but it's called succinyl-CoA synthetase either way. Now, in some textbooks, you will find that succinyl-CoA synthetase actually produces GTP, okay? There is some debate because there exist two enzymes. One is capable of making ATP, the other one is capable of making GTP, and there is some debate, never-ending debate, which one is more important and which one is the one that is really uh, like ha that is really doing this reaction in our mitochondria. Don't worry about it because GTP and ATP are easily interconvertible, okay, without losing any energy. So we can convert one to the other without any problem. So it doesn't really matter whether it's GTP or ATP. In the end, it will be ATP because that's the thing that we need for whatever, okay? So there do exist both enzymes that can do that or that, but it really doesn't matter very much from any point of view. Okay, unless you are experts on succinyl coa synthetase and you really want to discuss that, but otherwise it doesn't really matter very much. And this is the Krebs cycle. Okay, again, the things to take from it, it can run in cells only in parts, okay? So the cell can just pick one part of this, of this cycle and use it by feeding it an intermediate and taking one of the intermediates out. In some conditions, it can even run in reverse if that is needed, okay? So it is really a universal metabolic pathway that can be uh, fashioned into whatever needs the cell may have. Not whatever, but many, many different ones. Right, a few additional remarks. One is about this keto glute, yeah? Yeah, not sure where this FADH come from. No, from the cursor. Where? Show me where there is FADH too. Or any no, show me. Okay. No, because this is important. Because this is important. Where? where? Is it written anywhere there? It, did I write it anywhere? FADH? No, I'm asking about FADH because you mentioned FADH. Okay. I know that textbooks work with FADH. Forget it, okay? Yes, it is hidden somewhere here, but who cares, okay? So FADH is not really here, okay? Now, to your question. Uh, for example, the cell has too much NADH. It can happen, okay? It can easily happen. For example, it has so much ATP that it can't, it can't burn it quickly enough, and therefore, it will have a lot of NADH, okay? In that case, it can just use this part of the reaction and reverse it, which means that not only it will not produce NADH, but it will actually consume, well, NADPH, but you know what I mean, okay? So in this, in this reverse way, it can overcome this problem it may have, okay? I know that this sounds counterintuitive, and a few years ago it would sound counterintuitive to me as well, okay? But actually many cells have a problem with having too much ATP, okay? And too much ATP is a problem because it stops, if you have too much ATP, it stops the respiratory chain. And if it stops the respiratory chain, it stops the Krebs cycle because without this enzyme working, the Krebs cycle cannot run in its normal direction, right? So too much ATP is a real problem for some cells, okay? And there, in this 
situation, they can reverse or use just part of the enzyme that overcomes this problem and produces whatever they need. So that, that is the reason, that is one of the reasons why it, it may happen. Okay? Good. So going back to, uh, going back to, do you have a question to, to what I just said or? No, okay. So I just want to tell you something about this, uh, this ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Um, this reaction of oxidative decarboxylation occurs here in ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, but it also occurs in the reaction from pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A, and this enzyme is called pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, at the end of glycolysis, I know you've not done yet glycolysis, but at the end of glycolysis, the final product is pyruvate. You end with pyruvate, okay? Now, there are two possible, well, there are more than, more than two, but two big possible fates of this pyruvate. First, it can be converted to lactate, which reoxidizes the NADH, which was used, which was produced in glycolysis, and you export this lactate away, one possibility. The other possibility is that you import pyruvate into mitochondria, into the matrix, and then using pyruvate dehydrogenase, you make it into acetyl-CoA. And this reaction is also oxidative decarboxylation, because you take away carbon dioxide, and you make another NADH. So this reaction is actually the same reaction as this one, only using a different substrate. Yeah. So the reaction from 2-oxoglutarate to succinyl-CoA is called oxidative decarboxylation. It is a decarboxylation of an alpha-oxo acid, and in order for it to proceed, it has to be oxidative, so you have to release two more electrons for this to work. From ketoglutrate, you make succinyl-CoA. The same reaction occurs from pyruvate, because pyruvate is also an alpha-oxo acid, right? It's also an alpha-oxo acid, the same way as, as oxoglutrate is one. Yeah, this is the alpha carbon. This is also the alpha carbon. So we have to use the same reaction. We have to use oxidative decarboxylation. So what we do is, we take away this carbon dioxide, we take two electrons to form NADH, and we join with it coenzyme A to make acetyl coenzyme A. It's the same reaction with different things, but same reaction. Do you understand now? Yeah? In other pathways, like uh, beta oxidation, yep. do we get also the NADH or not? Well, yes, yes, NAD is reduced in beta oxidation. Why? <laughs> Why is it important? Something about that beta oxidation uh, also can give us uh, acetyl CoA. That is true. So in the same way we get the NADH. But that happens in beta oxidation. Okay. So from beta, beta oxidation we get directly acetyl CoA. Here I'm talking about producing acetyl CoA from pyruvate, which is the end product of glycolysis. Beta oxidation is a separate process which gives us both NADH and acetyl CoA. Okay. Right, these enzymes that catalyze the decarboxylation, the oxidative decarboxylation of alpha oxo acids are very complicated enzymes, and very similar. Pyruvate dehydrogenase and oxoglutrate dehydrogenase are very similar enzymes, really, even structurally. Uh, they contain three subunits, but more importantly, they use five different coenzymes. Okay, it's a complicated reaction. And I just want to show you without erasing this whole thing, because maybe you need it for uh, orientation. I will use this blackboard just to show you what happens there. So we can use pyruvate because it's quicker to draw, right? So we start with pyruvate. And in the enzyme, and this is something that you've seen before, in the enzyme, we have this special thiosol ring in TPP, in thiamine pyrophosphate. 
Now you're looking at me like you've never seen this before, but it was like a week ago. Yeah? Faisal, time in pyrophosphate? <laughs> now you're just nodding your heads to make me happy. Uh, I get that. Uh, but anyway, this is what's in there. And the interesting thing is, the interesting from, at least for me, the interesting thing is, that this carbon atom is negatively charged because it, lo it, it loses the proton. Yeah, there's another, there's another double bond. Yeah, that's right. It's another double bond here. Okay, so it loses a proton and becomes negatively charged. And this negatively charged carbon binds to this slightly positively charged carbon in pyruvate. Carbon dioxide goes away, and what we get is this bound to the TPP. You've seen this before? Yeah. All right. So this is the first step. This is the first coenzyme. Okay. Then this thing, which is actually an aldehyde, you might not see it, but it's really an aldehyde. It's not, it's not really a hydroxyl, it's an aldehyde. Okay. Uh, this thing is transferred to another coenzyme, which is called lipoic acid, lipoic acid or lipoamide. Which is basically a short fatty acid with two thiol groups. Okay. I'm gonna draw it, but you obviously don't have to know that. So it looks something like this. This is lipoamide. Don't worry about it, okay? It's not important. And this thing is transferred to this lipoamide. And then it is oxidized by FAD. So this thing is transferred here. I'm not gonna draw the actual structures because it would just waste a lot of time. But then once it is in lipoamide, FAD is reduced to FADH, FADH2, which makes this into an acid. This is an aldehyde, really, and it makes it into an acid because we take two electrons from it. But the acid is still bound to this lipoic acid, and then comes coenzyme A, and takes it away from this lipo lipoic acid because coenzyme A also contains SH group. So it just takes it from this thing and makes acetyl coenzyme A, which then leaves the enzyme. But that's not the end because this FADH2, which is always, as we said, it's always hidden in a protein, so this is not outside. So this FADH2 then transfers the two electrons to NAD plus to make NADH, which leaves finally the enzyme, okay? So this whole thing is inside the enzyme and these two coenzymes just come in or co-substrates just come in and take bits or the two products of the, of the reaction, which is the two electrons and, uh, and acetyl coenzyme A. And of course, this carbon dioxide just leaves. Okay, so this is the general mechanism of both pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is what I wrote, which, which is what I used here as an example, but also of ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. They work exactly the same way, only the products are different. Okay, now when I said it's five coenzymes, did I count it right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is the, in a simplified way, uh, the mechanism of pyruvate dehydrogenase, but also ketoglutrate dehydrogenase. Any questions? Yep. Which reactions in this cycle are irreversible? Well, yeah, so citrate synthase, very difficult to reverse, okay? Practically irreversible. 
isocitrate dehydrogenase, the actual reaction that we showed here cannot be reversed, but we can go around it by using a different isoenzyme using an ADPH, okay? So the reaction itself, not really reversible, but we can go around it if we need to. Ketoculturate dehydrogenase, practically irreversible, okay? Um, this is fairly reversible. This succinate dehydrogenase, depending on the membrane potential, depending on how reduced Q is, okay? So potentially, it can also go back, okay? It can transfer actually electrons to, uh, to fumarate, if need be. Yeah, that's it. Yep. It just takes the two electrons from FADH2. That's what it does. This, only with ketoglutrate. Or if you just want to, like a summary thing, it decarboxylates it. Succinyl CoA. Because it also produces an ADH. It's oxidative decarboxylation. Or dehydrate, because it, both things happen. It's oxidized and is decarboxylated. For historical reasons, it's called dehydrogenase. Like pyruvate dehydrogenase is called dehydrogenase, even though they are, they should be called, really, they should be called dehydrogenase decarboxylase. But they're called just dehydrogenase. Yep. How many electrons we achieve in the Well, count them. <laughs> Question was how many electrons are released in the cycle, okay? So we have two here. We have two here, okay? We have two here, and we have two here. It, it gets recycled, basically. So first, it binds this thing, which is then oxidized basically to acetate, to acetyl, and then it, the coenzyme A comes in, takes the acetyl away from it, and lipoamide is recycled and can do the next thing. So it's, it's a coenzyme. Yeah. Yes. But, yeah, usually you find 36, okay? But it depends, okay? It's not given because you can see that basically the only, um, the only ATP which is produced in the Krebs cycle is this one, okay? All the other ones come from the reoxidation of NADH, or in this case of succinate, and then it has to go through the respiratory chain. And how much ATP you get from the respiratory chain depends on how well it's functioning, what the membrane potential is, so it depends on the conditions in the cell, okay? So this one is sure. The other ones, it can actually vary depending on how well the cell is doing, okay? So learn the usual number that you find in textbooks, whatever, 36, but really, it varies. So when electrons, when electrons flow directly onto Q, bypassing complex one, some protons will not be pumped into the intermembrane space, right? Because the only, the only uh, complexes that can pump are complex one, complex three, and complex four. So if we start from, for example, cell succinate dehydrogenase, we don't go through complex one, which means that fewer protons <coughs> per these two electrons will be transported into the intermembrane space, which means that fewer ATP will be synthesized from these two, not from, but you know what I mean, by allowing these two electrons to flow onto oxygen, okay? So yes, if we are feeding electrons through here or through ETF dehydrogenase or glycerol dehydro phosphate dehydrogenase, all these ones that go directly to Q, we get fewer molecules of ATP per two electrons. That is true, as compared to NADH, which goes through complex one, which transports some protons. But the, num the exact numbers vary, okay? So we can't, yeah, usually you hear three ATP from NADH, two ATP from 
don't say FADH, from, uh, from this thing or from ETF dehydrogenase or something, which is approximately right, but it varies. Okay, it's not exactly right. Actually, probably in most conditions, it's not right. But, but this is what is in these simplified textbooks. No, yeah. Well, okay, before you start asking, I'll, I have one more thing to, to discuss or to talk about. And that is the concept of macroergic compounds, okay? Macroergic, because it's related to what we are doing here and also what we did yesterday. Macroergic compounds are compounds that are capable of powering some processes which are not spontaneous, which are not thermodynamically spontaneous, okay? Macroergic. Okay, sure we probably have some Greek speakers here, so like big work, okay, big effort, big work. Macroergic. Ergon, are there any Greek speakers? I'm sure there are. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the approval. Uh, so macroergic compounds are compounds that allow us to do some big work, okay, like power something that otherwise would be thermodynamically unfeasible. So basically they're compounds that through their hydrolysis or some other reaction decrease the Gibbs energy of the system so much that something else which is linked to it can, can happen even though it increases Gibbs energy. Make sense? Now, what makes macroergic compounds macroergic is how far they are from the equilibrium. How far they are from the equilibrium. Thank you. Okay? So it is not some special kind of bonds. It is not that there is a phosphoanhydride bond or a thioester bond or something. It's how far they are from the equilibrium. And this is super important. Okay? Now, we see here one macroergic compound, which is ATP. Another would be the GTP, which is there as well, because they, can, they are interconvertible. Another macroergic compound is this thioester. All thioesters or acyl COAs, okay? are macroergic because they are kept away, far away from the equilibrium, okay? So those work as well, plus some other ones like phosphoenyl pyruvate and other ones that we'll see along the way. So this is just about this term macroergic. What it means, it means it's far away from equilibrium, it can power something else. Right, questions? You had a question? Okay, yeah, by the way, yes, there is water coming here, okay? We need water to do that. Water is everywhere, you know. So it's, yep. Outside of the mitochondria. Yeah. When does this happen? Well, if we need to synthesize fatty acids, for example. Okay, only then. <laughs> only then. Well, if we need acetyl CoA in the cytoplasm, which may be for other reasons as well. Pretty much. So there is no way to transport acetyl CoA directly out of the mitochondrion. You first have to make it into citrate and then export citrate and then make citrate into acetyl CoA. Okay, so anytime you need acetyl CoA in the cytoplasm, it has to go through citrate. Even though the Krebs cycle can go backwards, you said that there were some reactions that could not go backwards. Yeah, I just, I just said which those were, okay? I know which there are, yeah? but it's just they, it, can go, it cannot do a full cycle backwards. No, not, not in our mitochondria, okay? Maybe in prehistoric times it could, and it probably did go the whole, but you need completely different enzymes for that in order for it to really go the whole way around. So in our cells, it can't. So when we talk about it, when it's only the same, only a certain part? Only certain parts, because really, if you look at it, if this whole thing was running backwards cyclically, so again and again, what would be happening would be that we would be actually fixing carbon dioxide and making more complex molecules, we would actually be doing what plants are doing, okay? We can't do that. So it only runs partly. But in theory, it could run the whole way, but not in our, not in our mitochondria. Yep? Yep. Look it up, okay? It's, it's basically a redox, well, I mean, in this case, it's not a redox reaction, but it's, it's a, it helps with the, de with the dehydration here, okay? But look it up. I'm, I'm not gonna show you the, the whole mechanism. It's very easy to look up. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, I know it's quite a lot, but I think that once you go through it a few times and you see the logic behind it, and the logic being that if it runs in this direction, it's always oxidation, 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 decarboxylation, oxidation, decarboxylation, oxidation, yeah, with a few other steps in between, it hopefully will, yeah, make some sense at some point to you. Draw the structures, okay, and look, look at the logic of the structures, because actually for me personally, I don't remember most of the structures, but since I remember what happens in the Krebs cycle, I can make the whole Krebs cycle from one structure. And usually, you know, you remember succinate or something, okay? And from that, if you know what happens, you can get the whole thing, okay? And that is, from my point of view, easier than to memorize the whole thing. If you have to memorize it, well, okay, you have to memorize it, okay? That's, that's how it is. Uh, but if you spend a little bit of time thinking about it, drawing the things, looking at which group is being oxidized, which group is being decarboxylated, I th think, I hope, that uh, it becomes more understandable. All right, okay, that's it. Thanks.